Hello and welcome to the University of Pretoria Mathematics Department celebration of the International Day of Mathematics, informally known as Pi Day. My name is Dr. Eder Kikianti. I'm a senior lecturer in mathematics at the University of Pretoria. Joining me in hosting this event is Professor Bernardo Rodriguez, Associate Professor in Mathematics at the University of Pretoria. Thank you, Ida. Thank you very much. The theme for 2022's International Day of Math Mathematics is Mathematics Unites. For this celebration, we will have a conversation with Professor Loiso Nong Ha, who is currently one of the vice presidents of the International Mathematical Union. We're actually all quite familiar with each other, so we're going to proceed by referring to each other with first names. Loiso, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. May I please ask Bernardo to formally introduce our guest? Yes, indeed. It is a privilege for me to be chosen to introduce a person of such high caliber, known as uh, Professor Nongsa. Um, Loiso attended Oxford University on a Rhodes Scholarship and obtained his doctorate in mathematics. Prior to that, he was a student at the University of Fort Air, where he completed his undergraduate degree in mathematics, mathematical statistics, and an MSc in mathematics. He has taught at National University of Lesotho, the former University of Natal in Durban, the University of the Western Cape, and the University of Witwatersrand. From 2003 to 2013, he served as a vice chancellor of the University of Witwatersrand. He's currently a professor emeritus at the University of Witwatersrand, honorary professor at the University of Pretoria, and extraordinary professor at the University of the Western Cape. Welcome, Luiso. And, uh, the audience, the audience will be very excited to hear from you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Bernardo, my friend. Yeah. So I think I can start with asking the the first question that we would like to know uh, about Loiso is that um, your mathematical journey from perhaps your high school days. Oh, that was a long time ago, either, but uh, let me try and recall. Um, I was only exposed to mathematics when I was 16 or 17 because at our schools, when we were growing up under apartheid, there were very few schools for people of African descent that offered mathematics. <clears throat> and therefore, because my parents wanted me to become a medical doctor, which required mathematics, I spent an extra year before I started what we call metric. And then after I finished my high school, I went to the University of Forte initially with the aim of doing a pre-medical pre course, the biological sciences and the physical sciences. Realized quite soon that uh, I was not good in the laboratory, but enjoyed doing mathematics. And then gave up this dream of being a medical doctor and decided to major in mathematics and statistics. And then later on, of course, I uh, was offered the um, possibility of teaching mathematics at Forte, provided I could register for a higher degree, which really is the reason why I pursued postgraduate studies in mathematics. As Bernardo has read in the short bio, did up to master's at Forte, and I was fortunate to get a Rhodes scholarship to go to Oxford for my PhD. Was that really simply being fortunate or you had the aptitude? Well, I don't want to say that, but it is true. Um, the Rose Scholarship was uh, something that we didn't know about as, as, as black people, as, as Africans. Uh, and I became aware of it because somebody from Rose University um, encouraged me to apply. And it's also a very competitive scholarship. And there had never been any person that looks like me uh, who got the scholarship. So I was lucky that I was at the right place at the right time. Were you the first person, Loiso? 
Yes, I was the first uh, black South African to get uh, a yeah, scholarship. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yes. Okay, that's mm-hmm. that's fantastic. Um, and w- was it difficult to? Um, were there difficulties? Is what I'm trying to ask. Uh, going to the UK for a person like you in that time. It was very difficult. <clears throat> This is round about the time I went to Oxford in 1978. That's a long time ago, more than 40 years ago. And, and uh, people who are familiar with South African history is that um, the South African apartheid regime declared certain homelands, independent homelands. So the area where I was born and grew up became an independent state in 1977. So that meant that I was stripped of my South African citizenship. So the first thing was the travel documents to go to the UK because these independent states were not recognized by anybody else. So that was the first problem. And of course, when I got there, I couldn't travel around, go to the continent and attend seminars or workshops and so on. I was just restricted to the UK. And the third difficulty I faced is that my training in mathematics, putting it mildly, was inadequate for me to pursue PhD studies at Oxford because there was a big gap of work that I had not been exposed to. So it took me a while to catch up with what other people were already familiar with. Yeah, Even though you already had a master's degree at that point, correct? That's true. And, and over and above that is that uh, unlike these days where somebody doing a master's degree in South Africa would do research, um, I did some coursework for my master's. So I could say that in terms of my knowledge base, uh, in terms of the breadth of things that I had been exposed to, I could say that it was wider than what current students who are doing MSCs are exposed to. Well, I do remember bits of this story that you've told me in the past. Yeah. And um, one part of this story that I would never forget is that your encounter at Oxford with Peter Neumann, um, the late Peter Neumann, and your surprises by knowing that people like Martin Liebeck knew so much algebra compared to what you knew, and they were so far advanced in comparison to you. Can you comment a bit on that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, as you you, uh, probably remember, during that time, there was that global project of classifying finite symbol groups. And and Oxford University was one of the major centers for that kind of research. So there were many people doing group theory. In fact, we even had a junior algebra seminar for PhD students doing uh, group theory. Um, and my supervisor encouraged me, of course, to attend this. And there I was sitting with these guys, Martin Liebeck, Christian Ronson, Jeffrey Robinson, you might know of him. That is correct. Um, And so on. And they were talking about things that I'd never heard of. And you you can imagine how frustrating that could be that your fellow PhD students know so much than you do. And, and there was a time when I kind of withdrew and, and ducked these uh, junior seminars because I didn't want to expose my ignorance. Yeah. Well, these are part of the journey of learning. And I think it, do, it does happen to anyone that comes from a different latitude. These things do happen to almost everyone that comes from different places, having been exposed to different systems. Yeah. Uh, with regards to, to your managerial um, contribution, your management contribution, let me put it that way. Do you think that you've become a manager too soon in your, in your life? Would you have possibly looked at this in a more different light if you had done it much later? There's an element of truth in that. <clears throat> um, I became a deputy vice chancellor, even a vice chancellor before I turned 50, in my 40s. And 
because of the nature of the job that 60 percent 70 percent of the time you are in meetings uh, and of course mathematics being a discipline research you do it in your head you have to concentrate on a problem it's not like an experimental field where you can try things in the lab see how it goes and so on now if you are in meetings you cannot concentrate and think about how am i going to tackle that problem so in fact um, after i published all the work that i was working on before i became a vice chancellor i took a conscious decision to stop doing research in mathematics and therefore coming back to your question i do look back on the 15 years or so 13 to 15 years that i was in management and i didn't do any research um what kind of contribution i could have made uh during that time but of course one cannot reverse time and think about oh if only um i did enjoy being a manager it was fun but tough yeah, perhaps the, some of our audiences probably didn't know um, your managerial career, so to say. Maybe could you just um, give a, a brief uh, overview of this university management career that you had? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I, um, I've occupied all the managerial positions at university. I, I started off being head of department. Um, at University of the Western Cape. Fortunately, I mean, that was an elected position. You do it for two years. And if you don't like it, you step down or you can continue. So I was head of department for two years. I didn't much enjoy it and I stepped down. Then the position of dean became vacant. And there were politics within the university. There were, there were various factions. Uh, that wanted to capture the faculty in one way or another. So then I was persuaded by people in one group which felt that maybe the faculty was not going in the right direction to make myself available for the position of dean. <clears throat> Again, this was an elected position, it was not advertised. So your, your peers would vote as to whether uh, they want uh, Professor X or Professor Y. Now, my, uh, my competitor was quite unpopular. So it was a walk in the park <laughs> to, to, to be elected. So I did that for two years. And in my second year, I was approached by the chair of council at Wits, who happened to be a very good friend of mine, uh, to apply for position of deputy vice chancellor of research. Now, moving from University of the Western Cape, having been educated at Forte, this being one of the top universities, this was really a daunting task. I said, no, 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 I can't do it. But he persisted. I applied and, and got appointed as Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, which is the best job I've ever done, to be honest. Because you get exposed to all the research that is happening within the university in humanities, in health sciences, in engineering. So you become a jack of all trades, low a little bit of many things, but not in depth. But you can have a conversation about, about these topics. And, and, and that has stayed with me because I'm really intellectually curious yeah, about many things. And, and you can understand why I'm so against specialization. Anyway, I, I, I did that job for two years. And then uh, my predecessor left before her term came to an end. And I, within that two years, I, was, I had been designated a senior deputy vice chancellor. So then I applied for the position of vice chancellor, got it, and uh, served for 10 years, which is the longest term that anybody at VITS has served. And I survived. <laughs> Have you got... Have you got any regrets for having done that? Or what do you think? What are your comments on that? No, I, I don't have regrets, to be honest. In the, in the sense that <clears throat> if I'm honest with myself, even if I continue doing research, 
I don't think I would have made the significant contributions that deep down I feel I was capable of. Um, two reasons for this. One, of course, is the isolation in South Africa. Um, we are very far from uh, centers of research activity. You have to go to a conference, you have to have something to present, and you can only go to one conference per year or once every two years. So there are those limitations. The second one is that uh, my area of research, which is a billion group theory, there were only two of us in South Africa were doing that. And the other guy, in fact, had already retired and, and he was just doing it as a hobby. So I was the only person doing that I could talk to. No, I can't talk to myself. There was nobody that I could talk to. And even globally, opinion group theory is peripheral. It's, it's not a mainstream area of research. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, would have, I would have continued proving theorems and probably published. But the thing that I would have been proud of is making something that I felt was significant. I think in management, there are a number of things I'm proud of, uh, which we achieved during my time at WITS. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, in fact, I'm proud of the fact that I lobbied for the Center of Excellence in Mathematics and Statistics, if you recall. I was going around the world saying that we want to have the Center of Excellence, will you partner with us? And, and, and now we, 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 have, we have it. So that's something I'm very proud of. And others as well that uh, I, I, I can't go into detail. Well, Yes, I, I do remember this, and I was part of this conversation in the country for a while. And um, the, that's one achievement that I have been a witness of. And if you'll allow me to join you to be proud of, then uh, there's one other achievement. And I know that you're a very humble person. You, you may not want to comment too much on it, but... I think given the circumstances, you may want to spell it out a little bit. And this is with regards to your contribution in fundraising, one, your contribution in bringing about awareness to young researchers in the importance of mathematics, and also very importantly, the demystification of mathematics. And I think in these three chapters, you have done a great service to mathematics in South Africa. We really owe you a great deal. Yeah. I second that. Yeah. Thank you, Bernard and Ida. No, I mean, yeah, thank, thank you very much. It's a, uh, in fact, uh, sorry, I mean, I, 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 the, the people I'm talking with trying to, of course, raise money. Raising money is fun. Because you, 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 tell, you tell a story which is persuasive. And talking about the importance of mathematics, if you love mathematics like the three of us do, it, it's really something that energizes you. So uh, I, I've had two or three meetings with these people. And, and, and I start off, I think on, on all three occasions, I start off by saying, let me remind you that I'm parochial about mathematics. And they say, yeah, no, you're so upset that already. <laughs> it's just something that, uh, yeah, especially over the last five, ten years, it's just something that it, it, it drives me. Yeah, there's so many projects that are funded at the moment, uh, thanks to you or in, even in the past. And I'm involved in one of the projects that, um, that, that you were involved in. So, um, yeah, I think Bernardo was absolutely right that uh, one of the big contributions you made was, um, was fundraising. And this is very important, I think, for, um, for mathematics um, in this country, that we need uh, a lot of support. Yeah. Uh, but, Loiso, if I may, um, coming back to your days at Oxford, um, I don't know if you want to share this, but I remember you uh, telling me the story that, uh, well, twofold the question. Well, maybe one, I want to ask a positive note, maybe something that you remember very fondly from your days in Oxford. And then number two, I remember you mentioned to me about your difficulty in traveling, um, going out of the UK, for instance, to travel as 
a PhD student attending conferences. Uh, could you maybe comment on those? Um, I think the, uh, the, the lasting, one of the lasting impressions for me about Oxford, impression is not the right term, but it's appreciating the importance for young research students of being part of a, a network, activities, people coming and going, which um, very few South African universities possibly have that environment. It's an environment that in the tea room you can learn about things that are outside your area of research. Um, so it's, it's, it's one thing that still remains with me and I hope that we could create something like that in South Africa, um, a, an environment where students can, or young academics can, can uh, interact with, 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 with others. Um, your second question is, is, is something that I, I alluded to earlier on in the introduction that when I got the Rose Scholarship, <clears throat> I was stripped of South African citizenship. That, that, that's really what happened. We were declared citizens of the Transkei and we're no longer South Africans. So all our rights to being South Africans were taken away. And therefore, I didn't qualify for a South African passport. But because these independent, independent states were creations of apartheid or apartheid government, very few countries recognize them. And therefore they didn't recognize the passport that you carry because there's, you, you say you're a citizen of Transkei, but there's no such country. Um, and the only two or three countries where I was given some latitude to go on special dispensation was France and, and the Netherlands. Otherwise, you'd go to, let's say, uh, Germany, German embassy, and they say, sorry, we don't recognize that. That's the end of the story. Um, and it really is a big regret for me because the proximity of the UK to the rest of the continent is something that uh, is enriching in itself. I mean, I remember some of my fellow PhD students saying that, oh, I spent two weeks uh, at, in Switzerland, I spent a week in, um, at CNR, CNRS, at, let's say in Paris, I spent that much in Bonn. To me, that was kind of. Yeah, but um, I believe later on, when the situation sort of getting a little bit better in the country, you did have some... Uh, experiences um, spending time in, in the U.S., was that correct? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, in fact, I got, I got my South Africa, things opened up in 1990. I mean, when De Klerk, a former president De Klerk, the late De Klerk, uh, unbanned the organizations and released the political prisoners. <clears throat> so my first South African task passport was, in, I got it in 1990. I, want, I, was, I was in my mid-30s. I know mathematicians will catch up. Oh, wow. he was 36. He must have been born. Yeah, okay. I was, I was in my mid-30s. I was in my uh, mid-30s. And I, there were, of course, schemes that sought to assist Black South Africans uh, to develop. So there was a scheme called the Harvard South Africa Fellowship, which was aimed at hmm. black South Africans to go and spend some time at, at Harvard, a year in fact. So I applied for that hmm. and, and spent close to a year at Harvard. And then there was another one called Equal Opportunities Council Scholarship, where you could choose any university that you want to visit. There was somebody that I wanted to work with <clears throat> who was working in uh, universal algebra, commutator theory, who was at the University of Illinois in Chicago. 
So I uh, used that scholarship, I mean fellowship for four months, which uh, allowed me to spend four months in Chicago, in winter. Wow. Uh, and winters in Chicago, oh. Oh. <laughs> wind chill. I mean, winters in Chicago, but I just, I just love Chicago. Yes. Chicago is one of my, is one of my special cities in the world. Yeah. And, and of course, when I was vice chancellor, I did a lot of traveling and fell in love with Oxford again. So what I would do, uh, let's say I go to the UK to have some meetings in London, fundraising. I would be based at Oxford and commute between London and Oxford which is about an hour and a bit <laughs> because I just wanted, I just wanted to uh, stay at Oxford, uh, which could complicate things sometimes because if you've got a meeting at eight o'clock in London in winter, <laughs> you have to, it is, it's, it's like midnight when you wake up, you have to catch a train and you go to London. It's crazy. In the dark. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Could you perhaps share with us, uh, Loiso, your um, um, your can we say appointment as uh, one of the vice presidents of the International Mathematical Union? Uh, that came as a surprise, to be honest. But of course, I mean, I had uh, I become aware of, especially the International Congress of Mathematicians. <clears throat> And the first one that I attended was in 1998, uh, which was in Berlin. And uh, one of the people, South Africans, were there was Daya Reddy, one of the best mathematicians and a wonderful, wonderful human being. Um, so Daya, fast forward, that's, that's my theory. Daya was on the nominations committee uh, for the new executive in 2018 and of course members of the executive have to look broadly across the whole globe because the international mathematical union seeks to represent mathematics globally and it looks then at issues of representativity various regions africa let's say europe the far east south america north america okay so that there's a sense of belonging for all people. So um, I would guess that uh, because Africa has been really underrepresented in issues around International Mathematical Union in terms of individuals. There's, there's lots of funding that goes to, to Africa, especially from the Commission for Developing Countries. I think the lion's share of that uh, goes to African mathematicians. But there had never been somebody from Africa who had been on the executive. There have been people who have served on the commission. So I guess it was uh, one addressing representativity in terms of regions. And two, there was somebody on the nominations committee who knew me. Uh, so I, that, that's my theory how it came about. Now, I asked this question as a, as a result of the fact that we are celebrating Mathematics Day, and uh, one of the essential reasons for this celebration is also the expansion of the subject. And one way to expand the subject is to grow students. And this is essentially the reason why I asked the question, to sort of see the angle at which you see these problems, and at the same time bring a problem which is very current in South Africa, which is graduate students in mathematics. Um, as you both know, the per capita of students in the mathematical sciences, it is very low compared to the number of academics that we would have wanted to have. So we need to produce more and more graduate students in mathematics if we are to see mathematics growing. Maybe I would invite both of you to throw a bit of your understanding on this and what ideas you have with regards to this. Look, that, that, that is uh, the way I understand it. I might, I might be 
responding to a parallel question. <clears throat> One of the questions I think about is what is the market for masters and PhD students in mathematics? I don't think as a mathematics community we have actually reflected deep on that. And the obvious question, I mean the obvious answer, sorry, that, that comes to mind for most of us is that they will become academics. But now there are limited number of positions at universities and there are young people who are occupying those positions. So, and, and the turnover is, 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 is small. In fact, this afternoon, I mean, I, I have got this group of uh, early career academics in the pathways to a successful career. Uh, I, we met for the first time today. <clears throat> it's a year long program. And, and the theme was planning your career. Um, don't, 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 don't wait for things to happen, make things happen. All right? So I, I asked them this question, how we know that to be evaluated, to be, to be promoted, you need a portfolio where you show that you're supervised students. Okay? So I asked them, how, how do they recruit students? And, and what, what do they say to make a career in mathematics attractive? So that, uh, for me, that is one of the things I would like to hear us talk about. Other than being an academic, somebody with a, what is attractive that they can do? Yeah, that is a good point. I think um, there was a book um, that I was, I came across, I believe, Mathematical Association of America, maybe the ones that, that published this book. It's called 101 Careers in Mathematics. Yes, it's the Mathematical Association of America, yes. yes. Yeah, and you, you go through these stories. So it's basically a collection of stories of people with some degree in mathematics, maybe undergraduate or postgraduate and the kind of work that they had. And this market, I think at the moment in South Africa is either non-existent or we, as a community, as you said, we haven't really thought about it. We haven't equipped our, um, our community, our mathematicians or, or our knowledge in such a way that our students can be versatile. They can be academic, great academics, they can be great researcher, they can be great uh, maybe um, researcher in finance, or working in um, in IT, or working in um, any any job. So data science is one of them, right? Um, that I think it's ca can use really good graduates from math from mathematics. Yeah. So I agree with your points. Yeah. In fact, uh, there, there is not there is an organization that I've been talking to for the last two or three years. Uh, it's called uh, I mean the project. It's under an organization called South African Graduate Employers Association. The acronym is SAGEA, S-H-E-A. They have a project which is funded by the banks. And that project is called Quantify Your Future. If you Google Quantify Your Future, they then there they are raising awareness about careers for people with a um, honors degree, possibly higher degrees in mathematical sciences that they can do in industry. You mentioned finance as one of them and so on. So, I mean, they've got uh, nice short videos of young graduates who are working for banks, for insurance companies and so on, who kind of describe what they do and what they found useful in terms of their training. That's, yeah, quantify your future. I think in this area, one of our biggest limitations is the lack of concerted effort to attract these graduate students. Uh, by concerted effort, I mean a well-structured approach into attracting them and providing them with lateral opportunities, not just the narrow, directed research professor to be but the mathematician who has the tools to laterally apply in many latitudes around neighboring areas of the subject. 
And I, I do remember visiting the UK at once. Um, Birmingham University had this open day at one point and also had these companies coming to the university. And many companies in the areas of statistics, uh, bioinformatics would recruit and they would target specifically mathematics students with an aggregate, aggregate in statistics and a concentration in applied mathematics. And subjects like probability, measure theory, they were very much at hand with these institutions and they wanted them because with that, the students could pursue much more internal research within the companies and could grow portfolios that were not heard of. And I think this is one of the biggest problems or it could be perhaps because of an economy that it's not as diverse. So there aren't that many opportunities because of the lack of diversity. But it's one thing we need to really think about, and it's, it's really a good idea that you're putting it into, into our heads, that we need to consider reflecting over this and um, begin thinking more globally maybe not as academics, but maybe as practitioners that can help society move towards that direction. Mm -hmm. In fact, as you were talking, I, I remember the, something. We have the South African Mathematics Foundation that also is looking at, at those questions. I think maybe much, much more than we do and, and the executive director is, is somebody who's very energetic, Kirsten, Kirsten Jordan. Uh, she, she's a wonderful person to kind of talk about what we can do, but that is one of the things that they focus on. So, Loiso, I want to bring up that um, we currently are collaborating on a big project. Um, we are looking into the, so to say, um, from the historical context of uh, publications that are coming out of uh, mathematicians based in South Africa and the students trained in South Africa and um, amongst other things. So we've had many conversations about this, but I think um, perhaps some of these conversations can be uh, shared. Uh, and one of them that I wanted to um, ask you to comment on maybe is that um, where do you see we are now as a mathematical community and where do you hope to see um, South African mathematical community um, going in the future? Ooh, that's a difficult <laughs> question. I mean, uh, I think what you and I have kind of observed um, is that up to 1960, uh, activities were not that... Very low. Yeah. Uh, there were very few people doing research, and and um, but then there's this period from let's say 1961 onwards. Maybe you can say let's say up to the introduction of the NRF rating. <clears throat> um, the eighties. Yeah, most of the areas that people are working in now seem to have started during that 20, 25 year period. Uh, in terms of being areas of strength, your topology, your mathematical physics, um, your algebra, although things have changed somewhat, there was ring theory and then Jamshed came and worked with people on finite groups and applications, the kind of work that Bernardo does, topology and so on. Now, I think we will do more on this, but I think their origins is just after 1960. So you see that, for instance, this, this the, 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 um, the manuscript that we have been talking about of the last 10 years, what has the landscape looked like? We found that the areas that are active in South Africa now kind of evolved around the 60s, 70s, 80s. But these are still areas of strength. So we suggest that there's been very little variety, if one can call it that, or new areas of study 
I mean, there's been new mathematics within those areas, but uh, very new, very few new areas of study. So I hope that we can find a way of um, intubating new areas of study. Not for its own sake, but I think Peter Sanak talked about mainstream, these are not mainstream topics. Uh, people will fight with me when I talk about mainstream topics. What are those? I'm not going to say. We can find a way to do that. Because the people are active in research, supervise students who finish PhDs and become academics in the same areas. So it's possible then that unless we consciously look at where are the gaps, how can we fill those gaps? Mm. I can see in the next 10 years, the landscape looking the same. Yeah. <clears throat> People doing differential equations, um, fluid dynamics, um, topology, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, I think... Um, all, all what do you think, I mean, uh, sorry, I have to say this. It's, a, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a fascinating. Uh, both of us are not historians. No. <laughs> 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 which is which is which is a uh, kind of feel feel guilty. Yes, there's somebody doing research in history, but they have not done a single course in history. But it's fascinating. I mean, for instance, one of the things that uh, um, is looking at who are the people, who are the black people who did their PhDs in mathematics? Yeah, and um, what inspired them mm. to uh, to do that despite all these obstacles? that we talked about earlier on. Yes. You can also, I mean, I'm sure that we look at the women pioneers in mathematics. Mm. Mm. Uh, we know that there's only been one female who has been A-rated in mathematics. Yeah. One. Why is that? Okay, so, so, so it's, it's a fascinating, yeah. I mean, there's so many things that we are going to do, which, which, yes. which, which, which uh, excite me. <laughs> yeah, same here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so to to recap, basically, um, what we've noticed is that the landscape did not change much, um, and we worry that it will not change much. But what we would like is to have more diversity, obviously, of 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 not just uh, in terms of gender, in terms of race, but also in terms of um, in terms of the kind of mathematics that we do, um, more in line with the global. Um, mathematics or what, what people are interested in, in in other places yeah but I was going to pitch in for some other reason and the reason why I wanted to make a brief uh, comment was with regards to one thing Louisa mentioned the COE birth the birth of the COE or center of excellence in the case of mathematics is a center of excellence for mathematics and statistical sciences. Uh, it's been a long road. And uh, the main idea really was not the center of excellence. It was more, we were thinking of a mathematics institute that could be started at WITS and I'm very worried that because you're no longer at which, as in the capacity of a manager, a person who makes decision, I fear that this institute may not see the light of the day. And this would be one of the biggest frustrations I would have because it would be an attracting pole for people to work and to bring the so-called knowledge that's scattered around that we can bring together and have a point, as you said, where young up and coming researchers can walk in the corridor and ask questions and feel at home doing mathematics at an environment where they feel they can do something. And the Mathematics Institute for me was the birth of that environment. No, I agree with you. I mean, it's one of my dreams, really, <clears throat> that somehow we can work towards that. Um, 
we need money and, and money now is, is scarce. But some people say that for good projects, there is money. And of course, I think if we can bring together the existing entities, maybe in a federal structure, that would be a start. The entities like the COE, like the Graduate Academy, um, I was talking to, I mean, need to be careful how I put this, I was talking to NIFEX, they also have mathematics and statistics. Um, there's overlap <clears throat> in what they do and what we want to do. So, yeah, it also requires people who share the same vision about there's the end goal. South Africa needs a National Institute for Mathematical Sciences. Yeah. yeah, so um, I was really taken aback earlier when you share about your um, the lasting impression that you got from Oxford of this opportunities for young people to grow. And I, I see now the motivation of all the projects that you're doing at the moment of fundraising all these projects and why you're so focused on young people. And we, I think uh, all the youth of South Africa, all the PhD students or early career researchers at the moment should really thank you for giving them, you know, giving them this opportunity. And I hope this will carry on to the future. Yeah. And I think um, uh, we should wrap up. Perhaps uh, let's, come in, let's come back to the theme of, uh, of this year's International Day of Mathematics. Um, mathematics Unite. Can we perhaps comment a little bit on... On this. I will comment last. Bernardo. Okay, well, um, I may have a philosophical problem with this. And uh, the philosophical problem could be put in a way that we cannot just do mathematics on the day in which we celebrate mathematics. It is important to embrace it and to take it along with us in our daily lives as we do it, because we do it with passion. And um, I'm longing for the day where I can see more of South Africans, school leavers, seeing mathematics as a tool for their personal growth. And uh, where they feel what they're doing as a rewarding task in their lives and influencing other people to change their own course of life. As for me, I mean, mathematics has done is just, just exactly that. As far as I can remember, there are many things that being a mathematician has done to me, has changed many perspectives, has made me see the world in different light. And I, I don't know, maybe I'm biased to the extent of being a professional in the subject, but um, there are many opportunities that I don't think I would have had if I had pursued a, a different path in my academic development. So my word in this day is, is, a, is a word of encouragement to those that see us as those that are in the far forefront in some way, we don't claim to be in the forefront, but simply we are just a little further in comparison to the others, that they should pursue this subject with passion and they should be able to bring empathy to the subject on the one hand, but on the other hand also be able to motivate others bring enthusiasm to the subject. Mathematics is not just about numbers and arithmetics. It's a way of life. It is exactly a form of being. And uh, this, this would be my little way of saying, I feel very thankful to mathematics for having made me the individual and possibly contributed to society that I have become. Yeah, from my side, probably I'll be repeating in different ways what Bernardo has said. Um, mathematics is a global language. <clears throat> and, and, and from that observation only, one can appreciate 
this unity that it brings about, that somebody could be from North Africa, could be from South America, from the UK, from Russia, from Australia. Um, if that person is a mathematician, there's an affinity that you share with that person. You speak the same language. Um, you care about the same problems, similar problems. Um, you don't question solutions. I mean, solutions are solutions. It doesn't matter whether the person politically you don't agree with them. So it's, it's a language that unifies strangers as long as they do as long as they do mathematics. Um, everywhere I've been to, and everybody that I've come across who is a mathematician, there's this passion that you feel, uh, that, that you share with that person. Um, and, and again, there's this sense of sisterhood and brotherhood that you share with somebody who could be a complete stranger, but you look at that person, you hear them speak, and then you know that you have something in common with them. And of course, I mean, when, you, when one looks at uh, applications of mathematics, uh, it's no longer just restricted to the natural sciences. Uh, mathematics has found its way into the social sciences, uh, into the humanities. Uh, I mean, in linguistics, you look at the frequency of certain letters, and people conclude that this text cannot have been written by Shakespeare, and so on. So it has managed to find its way in, in many areas. Of course, it has, not, it has found its way in areas where it has caused some harm. So I should say this, like, like financial mathematics, uh, the crisis that, that happened in 2008. Um, well, I mean, it's because people did, there were certain aspects that they didn't quite understand uh, how to, the mathematics behind it. Um, so yeah, for me, it really, it, 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 it does. Um, what do I see in common? I mean, maybe I can say that I have more in common with people who are mathematicians than people, maybe from my family who didn't do mathematics. Maybe I should put it that way, but you get the drift that I can have a conversation with the two of you for three hours, two hours, about something that we care about. Uh, I cannot have a similar conversation with my sister. Uh, we'll talk about other things with my sister. Yeah, yeah. yeah. From, from my personal uh, experience, also I feel the same way. I mean, I've, I've, I grew up in, in Indonesia. I've, I lived in Australia for a little bit before relocating here. And then, um, the mathematics, of course, never change. You just move places, um, and you always feel whatever there's a community of mathematicians, you feel that this is your home. Um, even though, if you look at the cultural background, it's probably not the same, and so on. And I think speaking as a woman, also often some, for instance, some of the people in my family would say, "Well, this is a, an area where there are not many women. Do you feel threatened, or you feel intimidated, or how do you feel?" And I said, "Well." If the mathematician, uh, the mathematicians around me treat me like I'm one of them, so I don't feel um, excluded, I don't feel intimidated, I don't feel any of these uh, feelings. There were some occasions, of course, here and here and there, which I don't want to bring up at the moment. But um, generally speaking, generally speaking, I never feel uh, like that. Whenever there's a community of mathematicians who accept me as a mathematician, then I always feel at home. So yeah, definitely, it, it unites in exactly what the both of you have already mentioned, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I think let's invite last last comments from from brother. There's one thing both of you mentioned, which I think it's reasonable to say. Yes, there is a bit of unit in there. Whenever I travel to any country, and I always have this urge to go to the university. I always have this urge to, to listen to talks. At the, and I always have this urge to go and see the maths department. 
I went to vi- I went to visit the maths department of that university. I went to, to hear the people and what do you do? What kind of things are you doing? You see, there is that urge. I need to be a part of something, of a big thing. Yeah, and, and it's there. It's there. And I just hope that this little bit of conversation that we had was sufficiently enlightening to the audience and they have taken a bit of particularly the historical views of Luiso. Luiso as an individual, Luiso as a colleague, and Luiso as a contributor to the development of many people. Um, I don't particularly, particularly say that Luiso has made a big contribution in my own academic growth, but having been around him and around the colleagues that worked with him while I was at the University of Natal and University of KwaZulu Natal later on, now at the University of Pretoria, um, I do have to say a word of thanks. Even though indirectly, I think I have learned a great deal of things from you. Even though sometimes I'm very stubborn, as you say, but... (laughs) (laughs) Very. (laughs) Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, I would extend the same thank you as well, Luiso, first of all, for joining us for today's conversation. And I've only known you for a short time, but I really enjoy our collaboration. I think we've learned a lot about each other, about the about our project especially. I'm also very excited um, by, by this project. And uh, yeah, probably uh, let's invite one last comment from, from you maybe, if there's anything you want to uh, say. No, not really. I mean, as as uh, already said, that it's, it's it's become. I said to I said when Bernard was talking that he's addicted to mathematics, and I used I mean I related a similar story that I've become so parochial that yes. uh, said that where can I make a difference? Where can I? And for me, there's no other area other than mathematics. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Yeah, thank you to Loisa, thank you to Bernardo as well. And uh, I hope everybody listening to today's program uh, will learn something from us, learn something from our conversation. And uh, yeah, happy International Mathematics Day. Bye-bye.